Um, I'm Shira West, uh, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Nottingham, and I'm chairing the session today. And please excuse a croaky voice. Um, I'm, I'm recovering from COVID. So um, I'm, I, I'm wel welcome to all of our uh, witnesses today. Um, I'm sure this is going to be a really fascinating discussion. We are dealing with Japan in the first half of this session. Um, I'm going to ask all the everyone to introduce yourselves in a minute. Um, each commissioner is going to have six minutes for questions. Um, if we are running over, I will gently try to move us on to the next question. Um, also, we tend to use first names here, and I hope that won't offend anyone. Um, Pranil Rudlin needs to leave at 10.45, and Hillary Ben needs to dip out briefly because um, there's some important things happening um, that he needs to deal with. So um, let's start with introductions, please. Um, can I go to Monaco first? Thank you. I'm Miraka Marta Iga. I'm a senior research fellow of University of Sussex and a policy research fellow of UK Trade Policy Observatory. And Pranil? Hi, um, I'm Pernilla Rudlin. Um, I'm Managing Director of Rudlin Consulting. Um, we primarily represent uh, an American firm called Japan Intercultural Consulting, which provides training and consulting to Japanese companies around Europe, Middle East and Africa. I've been doing that for the past 20 years or so. And as a result of that, I also kind of developed a research side, tracking the activities of Japanese companies in the region. Uh, for the, about the past uh, six years or so. Previous to that, I worked um, at a Japanese trading company called Mitsubishi Corporation, um, starting off with exporting British shoes and China wear and so on to Japan. Um, and I also worked for Fujitsu, which used to be the biggest Japanese company in the UK um, about 10 years ago. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, Kim. Um, morning. Uh, I'm Kim Derrick. Um, uh, I am a member of the House of Lords now, but I did 43 years as a British diplomat. I started my career in Tokyo in the early 80s and then uh, specialised in European affairs, culminating in being EU advisor to the Prime Minister from 2004 to 2007 and British ambassador to the European Union from 2007 to 2012. I then did three and a half years as national security advisor and finished my career as British ambassador in Washington. Thanks. Thank you. And finally, Nick. Yes, morning, everybody. Uh, Nick von Wessenholz. I'm Director of Trade and Business Strategy at the National Farmers Union of England and Wales. So we represent around about uh, approaching 50,000 uh, farm <coughs> businesses uh, across England and Wales. Thank you all very much. Um, I'm going to start with the first question, and I'd really like to get just a sort of brief overview from everyone on this. Um, so the question is, what is the geopolitical significance of signing a bilateral deal with Japan? And what might it mean for the UK's ambitions to join the CT CPTPP? Um, can I start with Monaco on that one? Thank you. Um, well, the UK-Japan Comprehensive Partnership uh, Economic Partnership Agreement, I call it SEPA from now on, is very significant in terms of a UK geopolitical strategy. Uh, this is because the uh, the Integrated Review 2021 revealed um, the post Brexit world foreign policy, the UK is really the appealing the Indo-Pacific tilt strategic approach. So then the UK government uses FTAs as a major policy tool to strengthen tie with that region. So the UK Japan CP became the foundation of these geopolitical strategies. And then, so then the UK is currently in the process of CPTPP accession negotiations. So Japan has been the really number one country which in, has been endorsing the UK to join this club. For Japan, having been exposed to economic and political challenges posed by China, the 21st century superpower that stands on the state-led economy at the next door, it is a very important hammer in market economy, free trade and the democracy as a common value of the world of trade. So in that context, UK is really the best, you know, the um, strategic partner and then welcoming into the CPTPP is really the big um, sort of win for the um, geopolitical strategy for the old CPTPP, major CPTPP members. 
Thank, thank you very much for that. Kim, can I come to you next? Thanks. Um, just a sort of a big picture overview of this. When I was in Tokyo in the, in the early 80s, um, there's no question but that opening up the Japanese market was the overwhelmingly top priority for the British government uh, and for the, uh, for the embassy. Uh, it dominated our work. There was a big trade imbalance. There was seen as being big opportunities in the Japanese market. And so this was, was very much uh, the top priority for us. We've moved on a lot since then. The Japanese market has substantially opened up. The EU-Japan uh, free trade deal um, basically eliminated substantially uh, almost all tariffs uh, and, uh, you know, was a confirmation of the importance of the Japanese Japanese market for everyone. Um, so, of course, it's a logical priority for post-Brexit Britain to want to trade deal with Japan, and it fits in with, um, as the previous speaker said, with the overall strategy of uh, focusing on Asia as the fastest growing part of the global, global economy. Um, it also, by the way, provides a good foundation for strong political relations and security relations if you have uh, a good free trade deal between, uh, between the two countries. So in all of those contexts, it makes sense. Uh, and it's a logical thing for the British government to have pursued and to have negotiated. But just, just one further point here. To put this into context, Japan is, I think, our 12th largest market. And I think the government's own figures suggest that the impact of this deal on UK GDP um, is about 0.07%. So uh, it's important, but it's not transformational, and it doesn't begin to stack up with the importance of, for example, a free trade deal with, the, uh, with our former partners in the European Union. So that's the context. Um, on CPTPP, I mean, all I'd say on this is clearly it demonstrates if we've done this deal and the Japanese have been able to do it, um, that uh, the deal must be, the bilateral deal must be compatible with what Japan is required to do as part of the CP, uh, CPTPP. Um, so it indicates there's a, there's a level of compatibility there. I think you, it helps a bit, but I think we have to recognize that the, when we come to negotiating um, our own uh, entry into, into this, this trade block, there are other members of the CPTP which will have their own issues and their own demands, my, I, I, I expect. And so it's not an automatic entry ticket, having done this deal with Japan. It helps a little bit, but other countries will have demands and issues of us. So you can still expect, I think, some tricky negotiations and some difficult decisions for the British government as part of all this. But um, it certainly doesn't make things more difficult. I'll finish there. That's really helpful. Thank you for that. Pranilla. Yeah, so um, I, I, my side hustle is I'm a sort of amateur historian as well, and I've been having a look at what the UK-Japan relationships were sort of 100 years ago, and um, it kind of sends shivers down your spine to realise that it was almost exactly 100 years ago to the day that the Anglo-Japanese alliance ended of 1902, it ended in around 1922 to 1923. And uh, the reason for it was the opposition from uh, the USA and Canada, which of course is a member of the CPTPP now, um, to uh, the UK having an alliance with Japan and, and America saw Japan as a rival in the Pacific region. And Britain didn't think we needed the alliance against with Japan against Russia anymore because Russia had been weakened by being defeated by Japan in the uh, Russia Japanese borders before. Um, but it left Japan without allies until its tripartite pact with Germany and Italy in 1940. So that didn't end well. And I think since then, um, you know, Japan has a, a long memory for this kind of thing. I think there's a very strong belief that you see coming out of Japanese politicians that they need allies and they need to maintain the rules based international order. And they've always seen um, the sort of the UK for I mean, 100 plus years as being an important partner in that. So it was very important to get this deal done. But as Kim said, it's um, negligible in terms of impact on, on the, the British economy, because the relationship is so mature. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Japanese companies have been in 
in the in the UK since before the, the 20th century, actually. Um, so there isn't an awful lot more to do on that front. Um, but I think, you know, if you again, as, as, as Minako said, if you think about Ch Japan's current interests around uh, defense, cybersecurity, and energy, and particularly the threat from China, they very, very much value, I think, a partnership with, with the UK on, on those fronts. Thank you very much. Um, I, I won't come to, to you, Nick, now because we're, I'm running out of time on my question, um, but we will come to you later. And if you have any comments on this, please bring them in. Um, can I go to Hillary next, please? Sheila, <clears throat> thanks very much indeed. And uh, uh, good morning to all our witnesses. I just want to pick up on the point that you made, Kim, on the government's prediction of changes to GDP I think you said 0.07% uh, amounts to about 1.5 billion. Um, what does the early evidence show has been happening on trade between the UK and Japan? I don't know who wants, I don't know, Minako, do you want to pick that up? Thank you. Um, always, you know, this figure just is become very really, that I get a kind of a strong impact on the public opinion. But one five billion GDP boost and the zero point zero seven, um, the you know long term you know in, um, increase. It's uh, something well that we really have to understand that, that the baseline of this DIT estimate, whether which you could see computable general equilibrium, we say CDE model. Um, that, that baseline is no FTA between the UK and Japan. And what would happen if the UK and the Japan FTA entered into force? But the reality is the UK was a member of the EU-Japan FTA. And then, then the EU, uh, sorry, the UK-Japan SEPA is a, almost a replica of the EU-Japan EPA. That means very or almost no added value there. So how one, you know, the um, UK, Japan, SEPA can create the value, economic value is a question, a matter of question. So I will just, uh, you know, when I, I, I'm happy to talk about the more, you know, the current trade relation after, you know, if you have any question after, but I stop here now at the moment. Okay, that, that's really helpful. Can I, can I bring Nick in here because uh, I wanted to ask what you could tell us about the impact on agricultural trade, because I know, um, as I understand it, we it is reported that we wanted to be able to export some agricultural products with a lower tariff, but it ended up that we could use whatever was left over from the EU's quota. Could you just say a word about that and tell us how it seems to British farmers from an export point of view? Yeah, sure. Um, so the the UK Japan SEPA more or less replicated uh, in terms of agriculture um, what was in the EU uh, Japan EPA, but not quite. Um, and um, some of those tariff rate quotas were where that was most obvious. So in the EU deal, I think there are twenty five different tariff rate quotas on agricultural products. Um, just ten of those were um, then carried into the UK Japan deal. Um, those were the 10 that was see, were deemed most relevant because I think they were already being utilized by UK exporters. Of course, you could argue that um, in future we might have started to benefit from some of the others, but that was the reason. But the, the major concern we had was that, as you touched on then, the way they operate is that UK exporters get sort of what's remaining of the EU tariff rate quota. So we sort of top them up. Um, the UK position was, and with some justification, that most of those quotas are not utilized fully by the EU anyway. So there's enough headroom in there for the UK to use. Um, and while I haven't seen very up-to-date data on utilization rates, um, I've got no reason to think that, um, that we've been sort of shut out so far of those TRQs and actually, Touching on the, the first question on CPTPP, I think the UK government's position is also this will be the case for the next few years until CPTPP comes online and we may get some better um, uh, preference treatment through CPTPP. But of course, uh, that remains to be 
seen whether whether that's negotiated or not as part of those negotiations. So in summary, um, almost what we had as a, a, a member of the EU through the EU Japan deal in terms of agricultural access, but not quite as good. Um, whether in practice that has any impacts will will remain to be seen. But at the moment, of course, this has only just come online in the last uh, year or two. Um, so difficult to to really detect what the, the real world impacts are, particularly, of course, with the pandemic, which has had a massive impact on global trade. So that's made it even more difficult. The, the one thing I'd quickly add is that we actually have seen some quite good increases in exports of sheep meat and beef to Japan, but that's m largely as a result of the removal of some non-tariff barriers related to those products prior to the agreement of, of the UK-Japan deal. It reminds you actually of the, the big issues often with international trade are around those sorts of non-tariff barriers, uh, not necessarily the removal of um, uh, of tariffs. Through tariffs that, themselves. Yeah. Okay, that is really helpful. Um, back to you, Shira. Thank you very much, Hilary. Um, can I go to David now, please? Thank you. Uh, and I want to ask about the, the current state of trade relations between the UK and Japan, particularly at uh, two levels. One, in terms of the co companies operating between uh, Japan and the, and the UK, which I want to direct in the first instance at Panilla, and then about the political ties um, um, and, and the, the kind of regular meetings and how strong and how important those are, which I want to uh, direct at uh, uh, to Kim Derrick. But Panilla, can I ask you about the, the, the company ties and what you're seeing in terms of the strength of UK-Japanese corporate relations over the recent years? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so just to sort of uh, give a quick overview, um, I estimate there are around 1,200 Japan-owned companies in the UK, um, employing over 180,000 people. Um, about 230 or so of those are, have manufacturing operations in the UK. And of those 230, 40 or so, um, actually it's more like 220 because some of them have shut down <laughs> the automotive ones, about 74 are automotive. Um, but of course, as you might guess, they uh, employ proportionately more. So about 60,000 people are employed by Japanese manufacturing operations in the UK. And about half of those that's de decreasing are employed in automotive manufacturers. Um, and what we've seen is that actually um, employment, because I think in the end, this is what it's about, isn't it? The jobs that are generated. Um, you've seen employment actually grow um, through to about 2018, 19 or so in those Japanese companies. And it's started to diminish since then. Um, and then you have to ask yourself, well, is that anything to do with um, Brexit or the deals that were done? Um, and of course, the only way to really answer that one is to look at what's happening in the rest of Europe, um, where we do see some growth in employment and growth in the number of Japanese companies. And there's been a slight shrinkage in things like, for example, the number of Japanese people living in the UK. Again, you know, there are students and so on in that figure, so it's hard to tell exactly which bit of that might represent corporate expats. Um, but generally speaking, I think if I was going to say in one word, I'd say it's been quite resilient, the relationship, partly because we spent such a long time kind of faffing around, Japanese companies are notoriously risk averse and long term planners. So they basically all plan for the worst case scenario, the hardest possible Brexit, and did what they could to, to, to sort of um, uh, protect themselves against that. So that did involve quite a lot of Japanese companies moving their, they might have had European wholesale sort of coordination operations here in the UK. A lot of them did, but a lot of them shifted that out to um, the Netherlands, particularly um, in terms of warehousing logistics and so on. So quite a few Jap Japanese companies in the UK became more like branch operations of either a European organization or of the Japan headquarters. And actually my old employer, the Japanese trading companies who are really at the core of a lot of this, um, I've been quite startled by how much the headcount there in their London offices has 
decreased over the past few years. And that's not a good sign, I don't think. Um, but there are larger trends at work, and, that's, and it's very difficult to disentangle that, because I think you could argue, well, the automotive sector in, in, for Japanese companies was always moving eastwards anyway, and now actually is increasingly moving down towards North Africa and so on. And those trends probably would have happened, whatever. So my big theory of Brexit has always been that um, it just accelerated trends that were already there. And Japanese companies have taken the opportunity to do an awful lot of tidying up um, as a result and consolidating um, and so on. But they're not leaving the UK apart from Honda um, and, and Honda suppliers. Uh, and uh, Lord, 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 Lord Derek, please, on the, on the sort of deeper political relationship, which does feel quite strong. It feels like Japan wants to be really strong friends with the UK. Yeah. Um... Look, I think if you were to ask the, um, the Japanese ambassador, uh, he would say just what you said about the relationship and how strong it is. And he'd be far too, too polite to, um, to say what I'm going to say, um, which is this. At one level, yes, they do want to keep a strong relationship with us. Um, we're still important to them post-Brexit. They appreciate how we contribute to global security. They notice how much we deliver for NATO. They notice how enduringly strong the defense security and intelligence relationship is with the United States. So we still count. But in my experience of, of Japan, both from my, my five years there, and then from staying in touch with the Japanese diplomats um, throughout my, my, my career, wherever I've been posted, whatever I've been doing, they set huge store by political stability and predictability. And I think they're really disconcerted by what they've seen in terms of the political turmoil and disruption and chaos ever since the Brexit vote all those lost votes in, in Parliament, um, the changes of Prime Minister Cameron resigning, then, uh, then Prime Minister May resigning, and now all the pressure on, on Prime Minister Johnson. And it's not what they expect of us, and it's not what they, they uh, associate with the UK. They always used to be great admirers of the stability and predictability of the UK political system, of the, uh, the way that our civil service operated, of the way that parliamentary democracy operated, and so on. So I think that we still matter to them. They still care about the relationship. They still want it to be strong. But I think privately, we are a little diminished in their eyes and not what we were you know, a decade ago. And they would be hoping, like many of our allies, that we can as it were, get our relationship with the EU sorted out and stabilized, that we sort the problems over the Northern Ireland Protocol out and all this kind of thing. And that we, we achieve rather more political stability uh, than we have done over the past five years. Um, and that we can return to being the UK that they know, knew and valued and trusted. So I don't think we know where we're about to be written out of the Japanese script in any way, but I think they are they are both surprised and disconcerted about what they're seeing and just hope we can sort ourselves out. I hope that's a, that's an answer. It was a very good answer. Back to you, uh, Chair. And uh, again, again, I'm sure the, uh, those who I didn't ask will have a chance to um, uh, inter intervene in future uh, questions. Oh, actually, Minako is waving a little bit. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. If I could just add to one point. While you're listening to, you know, Panil and then uh, I'd like to add, you know, one my observation. I just um, check, you know, quick, quick check the uh, the trade um, recent trade relation between the UK and Japan. You know, in general, over the last twenty years, the Japan UK trade relation was the upward trend, but that the trend changes from to twenty eighteen. And now the, um, uh, the, unfortunately, the UK-Japan trade is diminishing, <laughs> reducing. And especially the, what we have to note, it's a services trade has showing a substantial decrease, uh, both in export and import, especially imports. And um, 
So looking at the, that, that's what I'm, uh, I checked from the 20 year 20 and to the 2021. So it's very short period, but it tells um, kind of maybe new trend there. And uh, so looking at service trade by sector, major import reduction can be seen in the, you know, very major financial, you know, uh, major sector for the UK. Import of financial services from Japan accounted for 12% of total services imports from Japan in 2021. And then value was um, 56% lower than that in 2020. And the intellectual property accounted for 50% of total services imports and the value is 12% lower than the previous year. And then also other business services, which is 27% of total services imports, the import value is 70% lower than previous year. So that this is really something, you know, that with decrease of service trade of the, uh, between UK and Japan tells something happened in the, you know, kind of reshaping supply chains of the, and then also um, foreign owned companies. That means the Japanese companies already located in the UK, they reduce the you know, active business activities. So that, that this is something that we have to keep an eye and had a further study. That's the one thing I wanted to add. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, we are running a little uh, bit behind. So were you going to come in on that? Um, I, some, I just heard somebody trying to come in on it. But can I can I move on to Dr. Stephen Ferry, who's in a car? So I hope we can sure. we can hear you. <clears throat> Yes, hi, th thanks, Sheer. Um, I think my question probably naturally follows on from some of the comments that have been been made, I think, and uh, I think a, a number of witnesses have, have uh, essentially answered the question. Um, but it'll give people a chance to come in perhaps a second time, just add to those points, um, maybe starting with, with Pernell, uh, as she wanted to come back in there. But um, it's essentially just to try to map out for us a little bit more how th things have developed um in terms of a comparison between the uk and the european union in terms of their relationship uh with japan uh both in terms of the the terms of trade uh common conscious of we, we essentially have a rollover deal with a few a few tweaks um and also then in terms of the the nature of the trade in both goods and services and maybe ask um uh, nick in particular to comment on the ag agriculture aspect secondly uh, so pernil I, th I think that's probably what, what you wanted to come in on anyway so over yeah. to you no thank you um yeah now i was very interested to hear what Minako said because that does seem to um synchronize very well with the metrics i've been following on employment levels and numbers of japanese companies and numbers of japanese expats so yes obviously something around about 2018 started to really impact. I think one of the things that has always driven the growth up till now has been M&A. Japanese companies have acquired quite a lot of UK companies, big ticket acquisitions in the past, kept my business going very nicely too, um, in financial services and so on. Um, but that has really died down. And, and, and the significance of 2018 is that's pre-COVID as well. So it's nothing to do with not being able to do due diligence because you know you can't travel and all of that. It was from before then. And the big acquisitions, to answer your question, Stephen, um, in the past couple of years have all been in the EU. For example, my old employer, Mitsubishi Corporation, acquiring the Dutch energy company, Enios, so that was a very big, big item. Um, or Hitachi acquiring um, the power grid side of uh, the Swiss company, ABB, and so on, well, actually not in the EU, but anyway. Um, and uh, um, you actually now see, in fact, Hitachi is probably the biggest employer in the UK. Um, and that's largely to do with the rail business and the acquisitions they made there. Um, but th those have been in Italy, um, the big ones uh, recently. So um, I think the, the only way you can tell is, are we better or worse off uh, is by comparing with the EU. And generally, I would say um, that those all those statistics show that, that we we are we're not suffering dramatically. But as I said, that, 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 that thing about services is quite worrying because it, it says to me, for my business too, that um, Japanese companies are less inclined to buy the financial services, the professional services that the UK is really good at, um, particularly to support the M&A that they had, they had been doing up until now. In fact, actually, one, one Japanese company said to me, I, I said, has it changed since you became a branch and everything kind of legally speaking moved to Germany? And they said, no. Nothing dramatic, but every time somebody leaves our UK organization, they're not replaced. 
and in Germany they seem to hire another person. So it's this gradual drift that I'm seeing that, that, that yeah. does worry me yeah. for the long run. So, so it's more of a slow puncture than a blowout, essentially. And uh, let me uh, ask Nick to come in now next. Yeah, so um, I'm briefly <clears throat> on, on agri-food exports. Uh, as I said before, I mean, there's nothing in the deal that would sort of technically um, give UK food producers and exporters a, a better position than the EU deal because it's simply replicating it. And as I said, in some marginal cases, a worse situation. So, so you wouldn't really expect a sudden improvement. If you actually look at um, trade data, um, uh, things have held up quite well given the pandemic. There's not been a sort of sudden drop off in terms of exports. But actually, if you look at 2019 to 2021, there has in some of the main uh, um, agri-food products been a small reduction in trade, but it's difficult to know precisely what, what the reasons for that, given the geopolitical um, uh, issues that we face over the last few years. So um, I would certainly say there's no reason that we would be in a better position as a result of this specific FDA mm -hmm. than we were as a member of the EU because of uh, the very close relationship between the two uh, trade agreements. Thank, um, thank you, Stephen. Can I move us on now? Oh, sure. No, no problem. Fine. Thank you very much. I, I like the car um, analogy, the puncture analogy as well. <laughs> um, I'm going to go on to Tamara now, who's who's actually, uh, sadly, Paul Gervin MP is, is, is busy doing his day job. So Tamara is going to take on the next two questions. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, hi, everyone. So the first question I'm going to ask is question five. Which sectors of the UK economy have gained or lost most from this deal? Essentially, what is working well and what is working less well? Um, I'd like to go to Minarco first, if that's OK, please. Um, thank you for the question. Actually, I think as well, the sectoral, you know, the um, analysis, I think uh, Pamela is a bit uh, <laughs> in a position to answer that. I just would like to have a very general overview. Um, I haven't checked any recent data, but well, um, the, the kind of sort of, uh, you know, winners side of the UK Japan SEPA is uh, um, digital, you know, tech technology related companies and the financial sectors. Well, the financial sector almost replica, but it's still the, you know, um, um, kind of promoting regulatory cooperation and then sort of a more enhanced while well, the framework for the future cooperation. And then digital trade is uh, something that's, you know, almost one thing completely different from the EU Japan FTA had the more, you know, uh, ambitious uh, Closes so the free data flow and then other well the AI and the more more comprehensive chapter in the in comparison with the EU Japan um, EPA so have more kind of motives and then I can see after the EU UK Japan SEPA entered into force there's so many conferences going on of this you know tech UK related in, in, um, the member among the members and then between Japan and UK. And I think they are really, you know, advancing that try to make most of it. And then, and it's not a sector, but I, I think I would like to say that SMEs are facing difficulties, you know, post Brexit, well, the, um, the economic landscape because of the um, relation that, that large company can, you know, absorb the changes, the regulatory changes, political changes, and they are in doing business in the UK using as a gateway to Europe. But the SMEs are still, I think, um, suffering to adapt themselves. Yeah, I mean, Monaco, for my industry, the fashion industry, uh, you know, Japan revitalized the salvage denim as uh, part of the sector. And historically is where um, SME, uh, UK innovative brands launch because they're, they're very much loved by um, the Japanese uh, consumer, but obviously the numbers aren't there to meet the consumer opportunities of the EU. But um, as well as the, the, the possible tech links, I think there are creative industry links potentially. Uh, I wonder if you'd agree with that. I agree with that. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, because of time, I'm going to ask Panil the same question and then move on to the second question and, and probably ask our other two, uh, our, our other, sorry, um, questioners that just to try to build up time because we're running so late. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, well, just to say, I agree with Minako that I think if you're looking for bright spots, then certainly tech is that. And uh, um, the if you look at the Japanese FDI foreign direct investment into the UK over the past few years, the only sector that's really had a lot coming in, they're also going out as well, which is kind of odd, is communications. And I'm assuming that's probably um, NTT, which is um, sort of the British Telecom of Japan, really, um, ex-Ministry of Post and Telecommunications, now a huge company, um, has put their non-Japan global headquarters in London so that's that's definitely a positive um, and I'm sure that, that anything that can be done or, and has already been done in the trade agreement um, to sort of really increase the trust between the two countries around data privacy um, and around use of algorithms and so on I think that, that that's definitely a positive um, the JETRO, which is the, the Japan External Trade Relations Organization, does a survey every year asking Japanese companies how they've used things like the EU, Japan, um, and the SEPA. And um, I mean, 50 the most recent survey said 50% said the um, deal had no impact on, on their business. 22% um, said it had a positive impact. Um, and manufacturers on the whole found it more positive. Um, the uptake, um, they said 50% of Japan affiliated companies in the UK have used the deal to import from Japan. And that's largely imports of intermediate goods for using for manufacturing in the UK. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of that going still going on. And that's why I would say I would characterize the manufacturing sector now, once the shakeout after Honda, um, the Japanese manufacturing sector in the case is, I would call resilient. I think they're here, they've got good businesses, they're not going to go anywhere in a hurry. Um, and, you know, they've got it sorted, <laughs> basically. Um, and the challenges that they're facing are things around statements of origin. They feel they, they need some in-house system improvements themselves um, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and they have increased the value of their procurement from Japan by 3.6% since the agreement came into force and are procuring less from the EU than before, but are intending to procure more from the EU in the future. That's interesting. Thank yeah. you. Um, I'm going to ask the next question to um, Nick and then to Kim. Um, related to the above, what are the priorities for each side in terms of growing the trade relationship? Which UK companies and sectors have particular offensive or defensive interests? Uh, Nick first, please. Um, I mean, I think from a agri-food um, perspective, actually with a country like Japan, which is something like um, relies on about 60% of the food it eats on uh, comes from imports. Um, mm. There's obviously some some important uh, agricultural opportunities there. Um, mm. We have to recognise that they're often already being filled by somebody else. If you look at beef, for example, uh, Australia and the US are very strong already. As I said, we've now removed non-tariff barriers, which are going to allow us hopefully to increase exports there. So those sorts of products, red meat um, and dairy products like cheese, would certainly be the ones where we see there being opportunities uh, under, under this deal and, and indeed that existed under the European deal. Um, the one area where uh, there is a real need for uh, an improvement, in our view, is around um, geographical indications, so protected names and the like. Um, there were seven registered as part of this deal, which were the, the seven we had registered under the EPA. Um, but there was quite a lot of noise made about the fact that there would be a 70 additional uh, protected uh, designations um, registered in Japan. Um, that hasn't happened uh, and it really needs to. I think something like 25% by value of, of UK agri-food exports are geographical indications, are those protected names they're really really valuable particularly in markets like japan where you can use uh recognized and protected uh names uh on on products to to, to help uh to help the sales um so um that's been a bit of a delay getting those additional uh protections on those additional names um and it's something um you know we we are urging the uh the the uk government uh and indeed the japanese government to to push ahead with as quickly as possible if they can do that then i think that will help boost our our exports into japan a little 
Uh, um, Tamara, sorry, given timing, I wonder if we could go to Paul and maybe go to Kim straight away as uh, the first part of your sorry, question. Kim. <laughs> <Sorry>. and, <laughs> no, no, it's just, it's just, there's so much interesting stuff here, but we always run out of time. Yeah, but, um, but, I am running over and I've tried to speed up, but I appreciate I it. <laughs> no, you're doing, we're right on time again. Now. Okay, so, good. So okay, Kim sure. may want to respond to that question. Thank but you. Paul could um, go on to maybe start with him for the next one as well. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sharon. This is always a problem for us because these discussions are so fascinating and really useful. I wondered if uh, I could move it on a little um, to uh, see what the learning points are in this kind of post Brexit territory where we're relatively inexperienced. So, you know, what from this deal um, could provide a blueprint um, for us when we're signing future uh, FTAs with other countries? And perhaps if Kim could start and then I can move on to Nick to particularly look at the farming sector. I think there's been some issues from pre, from the Australia deal, for example. Kim. Just, uh, I've got my mic on, haven't I, so Yeah, um, just briefly on this, um, given the time is, is passing. Um, look, just on the, on the previous point, the sectors I would identify as particular opportunities for us without being a massive expert across the breadth of UK Japan trade relations, but they've always been important to us, are, are threefold. One is it's very difficult to break, I mean, it's a huge market, but it's very difficult to break into it. But the Japan defense and security market, which is tended to be American dominated, some of the stuff that we make now is so good and so niche um, that uh, there aren't American versions of it. And I don't know how we're doing here, but there must be opportunities in the future in a world that is becoming, that is looking more dangerous, where most countries are going to be investing more in defense. That has to be an opportunity for us. Second, I think we are, we could be better, of course, um, but we have some real strengths in the, in the high tech sector, uh, particularly in cyber. And I would have thought the Japanese would look at us and think that we really have something to offer offer there and uh, so there should be opportunities there and third obvious one i worry about what we've heard in this session about uh uk japanese use of uk financial services because that is a real strength for us and if we're losing out in that area now if there's any kind of structural as opposed to sort of temporary decline going on there that's very worrying because that's something where we have world beating uh, uh, capability in the city. Uh, and if the Japanese aren't using it more every year, then that's something to really worry about. On whether the FTA is a model, look, to be blunt, um, this is pretty much a cut and paste operation from mm -hmm. the EU deal. So anywhere where there is an EU deal, where we haven't yet got a post-Brexit UK deal, you can use the same technique, I think, to do a quick trade deal. And that's the way, the way we were able to do it so quickly. I mean, you would try and avoid the deficiencies in this deal as compared to the EU deal, but nevertheless, it's a good model for doing quick trade deals. More broadly, it's a proper free trade deal in that pretty much all tariffs are eliminated. So it's quite ambitious, although it's, you know, so was the EU, it's ambitious because the EU deal was ambitious. But I would just say, if you're gonna go for um, the effort that goes into negotiating free trade deals, you have to be ambitious and you have to take some risks and you have to accept that it's not all going to be positive for you with no, no risks for, for you know, uh, UK uh, manufacturers, you know, having you know imports coming in that are good competitors for them you know it's there's always um risks when you do good free trade deals but the overall benefit is there so so what you want is particularly to focus on on tariffs and just get rid of those as far as you possibly can um completely and uh and be ambitious uh, and take some risks i would say okay thanks um lots of risks for farming what's your what's your perspective nick 
Yeah, um, I mean, just a reflection, really. I, th I think, um, I mean, Lord Derek's absolutely right. You know, mostly total tariff liberalisation, but of course, as with most uh, most FTAs, not not all anymore, but most FTAs, there are still some tariff protections on on agri food, and that that's not unusual. Um, you know, at the time this deal was signed, it was hailed as a as a sort of best in class, uh, progressive, forward looking. Um, trade deal um, and Japan is, uh, you know, known as a as a fairly open economy. Um, and as I said, you know, Japan relies on imports of food fairly fairly heavily. Um, nevertheless, um, Japan negotiated some important safeguards for its agricultural sector in here, while at the same time liberalising trade and improving the terms of trade for for UK exporters, which is a sort of balance that um, you know most countries try to achieve in their FTA. So even after the process of liberalisation through this FTA over the next sort of 15 or 13 years now, uh, there will exist some uh, uh, tariffs, much reduced, but some tariffs on agricultural exports like beef, for example. Uh, there will continue to exist some quotas on agricultural exports, uh, such as cheese. Um, and there will be safeguards that Japan can use if imports under this deal, or in, indeed under the EPA, um, become damaging. Um, now, none of those have been used by the UK government in the deals it's just done with Australia and New Zealand. So at the end of the 15 year period of those, total liberalisation on imports into the UK of all those products with absolutely no safeguards available if things become harmful. So I would just reflect that there is a very different approach, despite the UK government referring to this as a sort of best in class um uh you know 21st century trade deal it's not the approach they've taken when they've had uh, um the opportunity to take a different approach with the with the two ftas they've done with australia and new zealand and you will be well aware of the concerns of the agricultural sector over the terms of those deals that's a that's a very useful interesting point to end on i think i should pass back to shira now thank you thank you paul um can i go to stuart next please yeah, thank you, Sheer. I'm, I'm, I'm here from a from a Northern Ireland perspective and look very keen. I think we've touched briefly on the UK EU or the UK EU relations and what impact that potentially may have. So I'll not 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 choose to repeat the, 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 the question, um, but might reframe it slightly differently, just in terms of the deal itself. I mean, I know there's reference within the deal to, to the NI protocol. But I'd be keen to hear just from Pernelli and, and, and Monaco, uh, to what extent has there been any consideration of the interaction of the protocol as it exists today with the deal um, and, and how that will filter, filter through? And also the second question is, what is the perception of Northern Ireland as a place to trade um, from, from, from a Japanese perspective? So just the first, I guess, to Pernelli and then to Monaco, so that's just that interaction between the deal and the protocol and then the perception of Northern Ireland. Hi, thank you. Um, well, I, I have to say that I think there are only probably two significant Japanese companies in Northern Ireland. Um, so Northern Ireland is more seen as a kind of a, a part of the market that they, that they look at for the UK. Um, and I have seen the occasional comment in annual reports from Japanese companies that they are finding it quite difficult to get things into Northern Ireland and that that, that is of, of concern to them. But I think that probably I have to be to be completely brutal. I, I don't think Japanese companies really understand or appreciate uh, this at all. But what they do care about, and actually this comes kind of comes back to what uh, Kim was saying too. I, I was felt incredibly embarrassed actually a couple of weeks ago. A Japanese embassy official said to me, he was teasing me, but it was quite pointed. He said, "Do the British really want to follow rules?" You know, um, and 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 that's that's because I was I was I was getting quite kind of I was getting a bit pompous about governance and the importance of following corporate governance rules, and, <laughs> and I just didn't know what to say really, because yes, that's what they thought we were like, and then that's what the relationship for the past one hundred years has been based on is that the British are the grown ups in the room, and and you know this would not be seen as as the British being grown ups if we can't abide by agreements that we made, is my sort of. <laughs> rather large comment and i'm afraid not terribly more than mm -hmm. focus particularly yeah. um at which point i think i'm going to have to go i'm very sorry but i have another session i have to run now so i need thank to you. switch over time thank, so thank, thank you, you very so much, much Pernilla, for that, those you. great thank comments you. thank you for joining thank us Monaco, yeah, do you want to come on yes um i just would like to just another two points or maybe just uh you know the um the first 
when it's uh, from the, as Kim rightly explained, the political stability and certainty matters. And then in reality, I do not think, you know, Japanese companies will export from GB to Northern Ireland. It's, I, I do not see so many. And, uh, but, uh, well, that, that really that gives the, um, whether Japanese companies can, you know, the trust Japan, uh, the UK policy or not. And so this is a very much um, politically un gives the uncertainty. So this is really bad, you know, the, the, the UK cannot maintain its uh, you know, attractiveness, market attractiveness in this sense. And the second uh, issue is as pe Peniel <laughs> said, I had from many Japanese, well, not only government people, but also business people, but uh, you know, what on us that the Hamon answer of the UK said, uh, we are the, you know, strategic alliance you know, that, that to who just uh, respect the rules-based trading system. Now, how that to uh, rewrite the Northern Protocol that the UK, um, UK, EU, you know, bilateral, were the most, you know, the next door, the most important trade partner for the UK, they just uh, overwrite the international agreement. So this is something really, you know, um, credibility matters. So th this is, gives that very, you know, a uh, big impact in at the business level, also the policy, you know, confidence level. Okay. Thank you. I'm content with that. Thank you, Sue. Thank you very much, Stuart. And and finally, just to finish us off, David, can you uh, do the last question? The last the last question. And this very much, I mean, Japan is one of many countries we can choose to, to give priority to. So what I want to ask of all, of all the witnesses, starting, I think, with uh, with Monaco, is how important is this trade relationship between UK and Japan for both countries? And what priority should the UK government be giving to this when compared with others. So start with Monaco, then Nick, and give the final word to uh, to, to Kim Derek. Monaco. Thank please. you very much. I, I have to be very short. Um, uh, the, I'd like to say the priority, well, the Japan UK bilateral trade relations is really important. Historically, you know, while well, the long, for long decades, well, the established, and then the, I think relations is, is very resilient. And in a sense, because of Brexit, well, that we shape that bilateral trade relationship, especially from the trade perspective, is more, you know, face-to-face um, -face bilateral conversation is taking place. This is something new situation because the, you know, uh, the, of the, the new challenge, the area of collaboration is, well, is a sustainable economy and digitization. So the UK and Japanese government can enhance collaboration in the, you know, support the collaboration in technology and innovation in these areas, but not uh, not to interact, you know, the, uh, a protective way or too much intervention is needed. And uh, also, the what, what I'd like to say is today's bilateral trade cannot be seen as a simple bilateral relations. So minimizing disruption, global value change, and supply chains in Europe is really important in that sense. That um, you know, good UK Japan trade relationship also hugely depends on the good UK EU post Brexit relationship. Uh, so I stop here. Thank you. Uh, Nick? Yeah, look, um, UK Japan trade when it comes to uh, agri food is is has been uh, very important. I think it's, uh, you know, fourth largest uh, non EU export or non EU trade partner. Um, and um, it's the sort of market we would actually really like to export more into. We, we've not been a great uh, exporting nation when it comes to agri-food because we've got pretty good uh, market on our doorstep and indeed uh, internally. Um, but even compared to other EU countries, um, we've, we've not always um, excelled. And it's exactly the sort of uh, um, you know, comparatively wealthy, big, uh, economy um, that actually we've got a sort of focus on improving uh, our, our exports into. But of course, they, you won't be surprised to hear me say this, uh, when you have got that massive, uh, comparatively wealthy economy on your doorstep, i.e. the EU, uh, it is it's clearly um, uh, important, critically important that the trading relationship with between the UK and the EU 
is improved mm -hmm. and now those things aren't mutually exclusive um so for us um you know it would be nice to do both can i just push you slightly nick with there's so many talk of so much talk over so many years that of of ways in which we're going to improve our export performance in place mm -hmm. to places like japan and it never quite seems to happen i mean in, in your view why has that been or what could be done differently well i mean i think there's probably an aspect of the domestic marketplace um it being sort of a bit perhaps even a bit lazy a bit easier just to, to to serve service that that's going to become more difficult now that we're liberalizing trade with other big agricultural producers so i think there will be more of an impetus like it or not um and that's one of the key things but um we have i won't for you with it now we we did in, uh, uh, produce an export strategy just a few weeks ago and i think one of the things at the heart of that is actually creating the right architecture and forums business led right across the food chain um to uh, to deal with um the nuts and bolts of this as i said when you look at say beef and lamb the issues there as they often are with the uk were non-tariff barrier for sps issues and resolving those so you can actually export into into countries um it's those sorts of things that we need to uh, to look at um uh, look at easing and so i think actually having a kind of coordinated approach in the uk um is is going to be very important to that final thoughts please from uh, former, former diplomat kim derrick please oh on mute <laughs> sorry about that um look, uk Japan relations has, I think, been one of the diplomatic success stories of the last 40 years. Well, I was there in the early 80s. There were lots of what seem now fairly petty, but were important times, squabbles about barriers to trade and unfairness in the, in the economic and trade relationship. And over the last 40 years, that has been absolutely transformed to a stage where we now have very few barriers and where Japanese investment in the UK has had a transformational impact on our own uh, industry and, and business, business community. Um, and alongside that, the political relationship has grown stronger and stronger. And so it's we're in a really, we have got to a really good place here. Um, and uh, uh, although it is only 12th in terms of our, of, uh, you know, our export markets, um, if you add trade and inward investment uh, into the political relationship, uh, what we do together on uh, security issues and defence and the rest of it, um, it's a profoundly important relationship. And given our problems with China at the moment, this is the most productive and most positive and important relationship we have in the Asia region. So all of that makes this very important. But um, the point was made just a couple of minutes ago that a good UK EU relationship is crucial to continuing this upward curve of UK Japan relations. And just to repeat what those have said, if we get into a place where we are, where we're into an ever deepening fight row with the European Union of the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, and where we are introducing legislation, which a lot of people, maybe not the government legal advice, a lot of people think breaks international law. Even more so, we're into a place where we are, we're into a trade war with the EU and putting out barriers to each other. That's going to be very damaging to uh, UK, Japan, um, and will deepen their concerns about, about our political direction. So if we're going to stay in a good place with Japan, which is important for all the reasons I've said, we need to be in a good place with the EU and with the US as well. So it all gets linked together in my view. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just thank our witnesses, um, Kim, Minako, and Nick? We really appreciate the honesty of your answers and all the information that you've given us, which is really going to be helpful for, for the commission and for the work that we're going to continue to do. So thank you for joining us today. I'm sorry I had to push you on a little bit, but, um, but uh, we, we needed to keep to time because we've now got India to talk about. Thank you all very much. And uh, I hope you are, I, you're welcome to stay. But uh, I hope you have a, a, a lovely day. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, we have all of our witnesses for session two. So we're moving on to session two now. Um, we're moving from Japan to India. 
So in a, in a moment, I'm going to ask our witnesses to introduce themselves. Um, I'm just going to remind commissioners, you've got a little more time, fortunately, for questions this time, because we don't have as many. We've got nine minutes each for questions. Um, and, but if we do run over, I will try gently to move, move us on. Um, and to let our, um, our, our witnesses know that we, we like this to be quite informal. We do use first names here. I hope that won't offend anyone. Um, but thank you all very much. So we'll go to introductions now and then get on to the questions. Can I ask uh, Pallavi to introduce her herself? <clears throat> Morning. Uh, my name is Pallavi Bajaj. I'm a trade policy advisor. Um, I work largely in the digital economy, digital trade and services space, uh, formerly with the WTO and with UNCTAD. Uh, but the reason I work largely in the digital economy and services space is because I'm also a digital services entrepreneur based out of India in the digital enabled learning solution space and open source learning technology. So I'm in that happy space where one job informs my perspectives and the other. And I'm hoping I can bring some of that to the discussion today. Lovely. Thank you very much. Sangeeta. <clears throat> Hi, and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me uh, at the session. My name is Sangeeta Kurana, and I'm Professor for Economics at Bournemouth University. Uh, my interests are primarily working on trade deals and trade agreements, and uh, I'm currently I'm working on the India deal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tony. Morning, everybody, and thanks for having me on. Um, I'm, I'm here. I guess as, uh, as the chairman of the Asian Business Association, which is affiliated to the London Chamber of Commerce and Industry with about two and a half thousand members. Um, I'm also the founder of um, Integrity International Group, which um, has interests in hospitality, both locally here in London uh, and in the uh, technology sector. And I run something called Global Hospitality Services. So very focused on, on property and uh, hospitality, including technology. Uh, I'm also the founder and um, I'm one of the uh, directors of a business improvement district with m multiple other members. Um, very glad to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. And Karen, good to see you. Good to see you, Shira. I'm Karen Bellamoria. Uh, I'm an independent crossbench peer in the House of Lords for the last 16 years, Chancellor of the University of Birmingham for the past eight years, founder and chairman of Cobra Beer, which I started in Bangalore in India 32 years ago. Um, and is now exported to 40 countries and manufactured here and in Belgium and in Holland. Um, and I'm also president of the Confederation of British Industries, CBI, uh, Britain's largest business organization. Um, and uh, I could go on, but I'll, I'll probably, I'm also the founding chairman of the UK India Business Council, which is relevant to our discussion now, and also co chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on International Students, which is also. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. And excuse my croaky voice, I'm recovering from COVID at the moment. <clears throat> so I will go on to the first question and I'll ask everyone to give a sort of succinct overview of their views on this question. We can obviously pick up other things in further questions later on. So I'm at, my first question is, uh, so what's the current state of trade deal negotiations between the UK and India? And do we know what Modi and Truss's red lines are, uh, have been during these negotiations? Um, and I'm going to ask everybody for a comment on this, but can I start with Sangeeta? Thank you so much. Um, well, as we all know, several rounds have been held and uh, discussions began uh, sometime in January. So the fourth round is going to start from next week, uh, week commencing the 12th of June. Um, now, with regards to, um, well, so far, Trade negotiations have been divided up into um, 23 policy areas, and these are broad policy areas that the UK government is focusing on uh, and the Indian government too, so that they can come to a deal. Now, with regards to your question about uh, the red lines, um, if you ask me this time, there are really no red lines. As far as my understanding goes, it has been agreed that um, there's going to be no demand that will be an absolute deal breaker. So clearly we can see that there's flexibility on the side, on both the sides to get this deal over the line. I'm happy to talk about um, other important uh, issues that may pose as potential roadblocks 
or where intense negotiations may be required. But at the moment, it looks like that the deal will go through within the timeline and there will not be any major issue that will really stop the deal like it was in the case of the EU trade deal. Essentially, I would say that if you ask me about what the asks would be, I can add that the UK would ask for um, higher market access into professional business services, financial services in India, in aviation industry, government procurement, because that's really very important. And that's where a lot of market access lies for British firms. Um, include a digital trade chapter. Pallavi would be able to comment more on that. Uh, have um, stringent rules about data protection, IP, because these are important aspects uh, for the uh, UK government. Well, on the Indian side, it's going to be movement of professionals. But as I understand, it's not going to be a deal breaker because there'll be some they are willing to move. It's no more a red line like it was in the case of the EU. Um, essentially, India would ask for um, increased market access into the apparel sector, um, services sector, agricultural processed sector. So there are going to be no red lines. The UK might ask for um, a chapter on labor rights, a trade and sustainable development chapter, but let's see how um, discussions progress. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Tony. Thank you. Um, well, my thoughts are that, you know, I, and speaking particularly from the hospitality and tech sector. So I agree entirely that um, uh, the intellectual property and data protection um, um, uh, is, is an important consideration going one way. I think that the, you know, post, the, the concerns about post-dated um, tax changes would be unhelpful and that, that, that didn't help. Um, but I, hopefully those things can be overcome very quickly as they already have in that second matter. Consistency and stability, I think, are things that, that um, India seeks from the UK. Uh, and to echo some of what Lord Darrick said about um, political stability and continuity and, um, uh, and being grown up um, are things that are always associated with um, the UK. And so those sort of broader considerations are important. Um, uh, and sticking by our international agreements. I think if, if those broader things can be considered, then I think that um, echoing what Sangeeta said, um, that uh, access to our markets um, and uh, doing it in a sensible way and sticking to our agreements would be relevant from an Indian point of view and from uh, particularly the hospitality and tech sector, um, that um, in intellectual property um, uh, 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 protection is important for the tech sector um, and, and free flow of movement of people. Um, it, obviously, visa um, and business visa um, expenses is, is an issue. Uh, an Australia-type um, uh, three-year working visa uh, and post-study work visa things are positive. Uh, and we know, unlike some other um, sectors, uh, some other um, uh, countries, uh, particularly the Gulf and perhaps China, that um, uh, uh, people from India um, do come work, contribute, whilst they're studying and do stay on. Um, and, um, and so there are, they, they do contribute while they're here. So perhaps they need some special consideration and not be, and be classed as, uh, as some of the others. Thank you very much. Karen. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you. What, what I, uh, we've just had a very useful um, visit by the Indian uh, Commerce and Industry Minister, Piyush Goyal who was here um, and we had the, the, the chief negotiator from India as well as our chief negotiator. So we had a few days of interaction, including with Anne-Marie Trevelyan, our Secretary of State for International Trade. And one of the things that stood out for me is um, Piyush Goyal, Minister Piyush Goyal made it very clear that the backdrop in these negotiations, uh, he is requesting that we um, take into account the, the differences that we're, we're trying to do a deal here between a country of 67 million people and a country of 1.4 billion people. We're trying to do a deal here where he said it's not on equal terms in that although we're the fifth and sixth largest economies in the world, um, India has a per capita income of a couple of thousand dollars a year, whereas our per capita income is 30 times bigger than that. Uh, so he said, you've got to keep that in perspective that we've got a way to go in India uh, to catch up in terms of per capita income and so, you know, you cannot say 
uh, you're, you're, you're negotiating on equal terms. So that backdrop, I think, is very important when we're looking at this negotiation. Uh, that said, I've been very involved with the C CBI president in the Australia, uh, New Zealand, and the rollover of the 66 bilateral EU trade deals before the transition period ended. And what I can say is the Australia deal is the template for the most comprehensive modern free trade agreement in the world. And it's got everything in there. And that was done with one year of negotiation. Uh, it took a little longer to close it, uh, and there were a few hurdles, and it's got all the sensitive areas like agriculture in it as well. Uh, it's got movement of people, innovation, digital, etc. So I think uh, how comprehensive can we make this deal? Um, our chief negotiator, Harjinder, is very, very keen and, and confident that it can be comprehensive. Uh, and I think that's got to be one objective that our members, our CBI members, do not want a, a skinny deal. We want a comprehensive deal. The pace of it, it can be done. We've shown we can do it with Australia and with New Zealand. Um, India has shown they can do it even quicker. The Indian trade deal with the UAE was done in 88 days. Uh, and the Indian-Australia deal was done very quickly as well. So both parties can move at speed. So realistically, we can complete it by Diwali, or if not, by the end of this year. And, and the key at this stage, I would say of my comments, I'll bring in more contributions later on in more detail, uh, is to be as comprehensive uh, as possible. Thank you very much. And finally, Pallavi. Thank you. Um, so much has been said, and that makes my life a lot easier because I think I broadly agree with almost everything that's been said. I think we've had three rounds of discussions, two extremely productive, the last two. They're looking at an interim deal by October. Uh, that's allegedly going to cover about 65% trade in goods, 40% trade in services. So that's that's ambitious, but like everyone said, I don't think it's too ambitious because like Sangeeta was rightly saying, red lines, if any, are all in pencil uh, at this point. And so there will be discussions on almost everything. And also, I think a lot of discussions are already in progress to me. Um, again, I agree that the largest priority areas are going to be uh, for me, the greatest benefits of the deal are really going to be in behind the border measures. What we were discussing earlier, what Tony and Singita were both saying that IP institu institutional frameworks, regulatory frameworks, behind the border measures, simplification of procedures, mutual recognition. I think that's where the real meat of the benefits is going to come from. Reduction in tariffs will only take us that far on market access. But really, the most encouraging part of the progress that has happened so far for me is uh, the industry task force that has been set up. These are two industry bodies that are representing over 300,000 businesses on both sides of varied sizes. And this is really taking stakeholder negotiation all the way to the end of the FTA. And I think that's so encouraging because when you allow businesses to not just discuss um, key priority areas or trade-offs, but actually monitor timelines in the FTAs, you're really giving it to the stakeholders to say, let's take this all the way in the time that we said we would. And I think that's extremely encouraging. I hope that the task force is going to do what it has been tasked with really monitor timelines, because that's for me going to make the difference between meeting the deadlines and not meeting the deadlines, because everything else, like everyone has said, is it's very doable. It's not too ambitious. Thank you very much. Um, that was that was a very good, optimistic set of views. Can I go to David? Yes. Uh... Thank you, Sharon. It was a very good optimistic set of views, but not without a certain amount of contradiction, which I just want to probe within it. In particular, um, with reference to other negotiations that India has been uh, uh, recently uh, taking part in and the ones that UK have been doing. Um, so India has recently completed deals with Australia and um, the UAE. Uh, the UK has completed deals with Australia and New Zealand. The India and the UK deals with Australia don't look particularly similar. And I'm just wondering if um, our witnesses, starting with Pallavi, could actually comment on the level of ambition that India and the UK are actually approaching this with, and particularly also interested in picking up on the, on the comments that were made about the, the remarks of the Indian minister in suggesting, ah, well, you know, it's different if because we're a much larger, but also a less less developed country. Seems like there's quite a lot we can bring out there in uh, in, in terms of how this deal might be structured. Could I start with Pallavi on that, please? Of course you can. Um, I think I think it's ambitious, definitely, to have the kind of deal we're looking at. I think like like Sangeeta was saying, there are no red lines. Uh, everything is up for discussion. But the truth is that there are also 
areas that are difficult to negotiate on both sides. India will look for more uh, mode for access, and that's always hard to negotiate. But again, it comes with the caveat that digital trade has made the lines already blurry on provision of services. It's completely changed the landscape of how services are being provided. So I think it might already be time to revisit how we liberalize mode four or services in general. Um, also, in terms of uh, the differences that the minister was talking about, they exist. You can't deny them. Uh, it, like like Karan was saying as well, that the population is different, the GDP is different, the per capita income is different, the priorities are different. But I think if they've embarked on what seems to be an effort at a more structured collaborative relationship as opposed to India just being the large develop, developing country market with you know a, a growing middle class with lots of disposable income, I think that the deal is looking at everything beyond just that market access. And I think that's what's very encouraging. Uh, also, the Indian uh, approach, if I can take a second to say that, recently has not been that. It has not been we're just a developing country with a big market to give you access to. It has been more collaborative. It is a more a mature acknowledgement of our own strengths and, and our position in the global economy and our own comparative advantages. To say that, you know, there is there is national interest, yes, but there is also everybody grows better if they grow together. And I think a really good example of that was also seen with AstraZeneca and Serum Institute collaborating over COVID vaccines, which was on the one hand, pure economics playing on each other's strengths and delivering large scale vaccine production. On the other hand, also benefiting a lot of countries in the process that would not have had access to vaccines. And I think it's that, that collaborative playing on each other's strengths that I think would be the end ambition of this deal. I don't think it is about just market access. And just to just to sort of push you on one issue that you're the you're an expert on data, data localization. India has very different data rules from those that the UK would like to see. How do you see that issue being resolved? I'm going to say India is definitely like with the EU, looking as being recognised as a data secure nation. And again, there are differences there. There are differences on, say, source code. Uh, you know, revealing the source code, particularly in public uh, procurement contracts. They, they exist, but I know that for India, because the digital services sector is being driven largely by smaller enterprises, it's going to be something that India will want. And I'm sure that there are ways to fix that. I mean, data security is always going to be more about accountability of enterprises and of stakeholders. And I think if we can fixate on that, instead of making it about broad regulatory frameworks, just talk about accountability and an implementation of those accountability frameworks. I think it's very, it's not, I mean, I work in the digital services sector. So we deal with data security requirements every day. And we know that it really comes down to how you handle them on ground practically with accountability. And if they include, like I was saying, businesses in those discussions, which I think is what the industry task force is trying to do, I think it's very doable to find that middle ground, uh, which is mutually beneficial for businesses and in terms of you know the government's own policy interests. Um, turn to you, Tony, because you mentioned some wider issues that aren't always necessarily in a in a in a, in a free in a free trade agreement. How how would you see the levels of ambition or where they should be for both the UK and India? Well, there's the ambition and there's the reality. Um, and um, I'm not sure where we lie on that spectrum. Um, I guess it's the difference between a deal and transaction uh, and a relationship, and I think that's probably where the distinction lies. We, we need to build a relationship between the countries and a, an understanding, and at the very broadest level, that we act as grown-ups in the room, as somebody has already cited today, um, uh, that we can trust each other, uh, and that leads to part of what Pallavi said about, about data protection, security, um, um, trust and reliance on, on the legal frameworks and so on. Um, and that, that is built over time. Relationships don't happen in the same way as a single transaction on a deal. So when people talk about trade deals, it slightly concerns me. Um, they, um, uh, and so th those are, that's the broad framework. Uh, I think if we get an understanding, you know, information and knowledge and then understanding, and then we tend to respect each other's decisions. Um, and some, some of that goes to the broader issue about trusting e e each other in, in you know, the political sense, political stability, continuity, um, uh, and you know, as opposed to division. And I think if we can, if we can, if we can establish that, that foundation stone of trust 
um, then that's good for the relationship going forward. And then we can we can enter negotiations uh, and and secure a long term relationship and the framework that goes beyond that. Um, it, it's it's from from a hospitality sector. I, I mean, we've we've touched on Pallavi's touched on the technology uh, aspects and, uh, and and her confidence and, and assurances uh, as to that as the hospitality sector. Um, it, it's it's I targeted as as a, as a growth market. Um, if, if we say the EU and um, the USA are big markets to the hospitality sector in the UK, incoming visitors, um, business and leisure, um, uh, and, and, and if we could if we could maintain those as stable, the growth would come from other other sectors, including and especially um, uh, the suppressed demand from India. Um, and there is an anxiety, there is a there is a desire from India and from Indians and businesses and leisure and business travel and events to to come to the UK. But there are also barriers and, and hindrances to that, and we need to try to um, uh, to overcome some of those to give people the same kind of, of passageway uh, as perhaps people from the the white sub, the, the the white former Commonwealth, including in Australia, where we do have a trade deal and we do have arrangements for students and for uh, for visas and so on. So I think that's a very broader fr the framework, and that's probably I can't speak on behalf of the two and a half thousand London Chamber members because they're so disparate and. and uh, uh, and at a different scale and in all kinds of sectors. But from the hospitality sector and the IT sector where, where I, my businesses sit, I, I do have a view uh, as expressed. Uh, Karen Villamaria, if I can turn, turn to, to you about, and, and it, following up the, the, that re, the relationship, I'm, I'm always curious, why is there not a stronger UK-India relationship already? Can, so are we hoping the FTA brings that stronger relationship? Is that part of the ambition here? We've got a very strong relationship. There, there's no question about that. If you were around the table with Minister Goel and Anne-Marie Trevelyan, any of the interaction, that's a fantastic relationship enhanced by the one and a half million people of Indian origin, the living bridge, people like me uh, in the UK. So, you know, it's, it's a fantastic relationship, lots more potential. The negatives, we disbanded the UK-India Roundtable, which I was a member of in 2014. It was a fantastic initiative. We came up with the UK-India Research Initiative, UKERI, which went into phase three of twinning academics between our two countries. Phenomenal to increase cross-border collaboration and innovation. Um, that came out of the UK-India Roundtable. The two-year post-graduation work visa came out of the UK-India Roundtable, which I then championed in Parliament. I led the way in the House of Lords, came into place in 2008, taken away in 2012 by Theresa May, brought back in by Boris Johnson last year on the 1st of July. The number of Indian students is rocketing since the two years have been brought back in. And we need to take that even further. International students, Paul Bromfield's over here, my co-chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group for International Students. We produced a report. We asked the government to set a target for international students. They set a target of 600,000, we've beaten that target. I've not personally set a target of a million international students. And I think Indians are gonna overtake China as the number one overseas students very soon. So that's very positive, but the disbanding of the UK India Roundtable is not good news. I'm a member of the UK India CEOs forum. It has not met for two years, not even virtually. So what I've done is I've founded the UK Industry Task Force, which I launched in India with the CII, the Confederation of Indian Industry and the CBI, to help with this FTA, which I think Pallavi is referring to. We've got to do something to help take this forward if the governments themselves are not doing it. Uh, so I think the potential is there, the relationship is there, we've got to build on it. Uh, thank, thank you. Sorry, I'm nearly out of time, but can I just yeah. turn find, quickly to, uh, yeah, to, a quick, to, quick to say, point, Sangeeta again about the level of ambition? Is there a similar level of ambition for a UK and India here? Well, I, I just hope that the trade deal does not mimic the ambition that the um, India and the uh, Australian deal had. Because if you look at the Australian deal that India has done, it's not very deep. I would much prefer that the UK deal with India is deep and comprehensive because the deeper and more comprehensive the trade deal, the more the benefits for both the partners. Because I mean, I'll just take one second and allude to public procurement. So in public procurement chapter that India has concluded with Australia, you find that, there, that India has not given any market access uh, to Australia in public procurement. Uh, and I hope that's not the case with the UK, because uh, if you there are so many carve outs in that chapter, I'm glad to talk about it later. I'm conscious of time. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you.
<clears throat> Thank you very much. We we will give you plenty of time later to 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 follow that up. Um, Tamara, I'm going to you now. Thank you so much. So my question is, let me just get it up for you. Uh, what are the priorities for each side in terms of the negotiation and growing the trade relationship? Which UK companies and sectors have? Oh no, I'm I'm yes, I am on the right question. Which UK companies and sectors have particular offensive or defensive interests? And I will ask. Um, send you to that question first, please. Thank you so much. Um, well, if we look at the priorities, I think a deepening the partnership. Most importantly, I think if you look at the tariff profile, we find that tariffs that UK firms face higher tariffs in India than Indian firms face in the UK. So it's important to reduce tariffs. And more important is, and is reducing non-tariff barriers. Because if you look at the non-tariff barriers that British firms face in India, they are absolutely phenomenal. So I did a study of, um, in 2020, looking at what was the incidence of barriers that UK firms faced in India. And we found that we could break up barriers by horizontal generic barriers and also sector specific barriers. And these were absolutely, they ran into, if you quantify once when we quantified the value of these barriers, they ran into billions. Um, I mean, the value of those barriers when we quantified them was running into billions. So this is clearly business lost. So if you ask me, the priorities are going to be increasing market access, reducing tariffs and reducing non-tariff barriers. Now, with regard, uh, what, sorry, what was the other question? Was with regards to the sectors, right? Yes. Right, so I think there are a couple of sectors that uh, can benefit from this trade deal directly. Um, we understand that partners are looking to reduce tariffs. And from the UK perspective, I can say the objective will be to reduce tariffs on cars and whiskey, because whiskey really faces a very high tariff in India. We heard about and, that in a previous session, about the, yes. the whiskey industry. Exactly. So I'll and then I'll talk a little bit about the automotive components. Um, now, India has an India increased tariffs last year. In 2020, in, India increased tariffs from 7.5% to 15% on automotive products in 2020. Now, these are areas that the UK would like to target. Another area I would like to uh, highlight is, um, is that of chemicals. Uh, now, chemicals are amongst the fastest growing sectors where both the countries have got massive investments. And this is going, and this is likely going to continue in the long term as well. But the issue is that the UK firms, chemical firms, face challenges when they navigate the Indian um, approval process landscape because the requirements are forever changing and the authorization procedures also keep, um, keep getting altered over time. So uh, if you ask me, these are the sectors that the UK would be looking for in goods. In services as well, the UK would be looking to see, get uh, an understanding on the digital chapter, and most importantly, in terms of legal services. Yeah. So, Architectural services. Yeah, Sanjita, I work in the fashion industry and I'm aware of time, but what would be fantastic is if you could um, send over, if we, because I'm going to revert to Lord Billy Moria to answer this question as well, is if you could perhaps connect with the Secretariat and I could explore some of the data that you might have around the textile we'll fashion industry, because obviously that's a key priority for we'll uh, any relationship with India. Lord Billy Moria, Moria, would you like me to repeat the question to you? Because uh, I realised it was a bit of a time away. Or, or... I, I, um, so I think you've got to keep, again, the potential is huge in a variety of sectors. We, the UK, are traditionally the second largest services exporter in the world. So obviously, services are important to us. Now, you go to lawyers. Foreign lawyers are still not allowed to practice in India. And we're saying, why can't we have this trade deal allowing, for example, our solicitors to provide advisory work in India. Maybe our barristers can't practice in the courts in India if that's a problem. But an interim phase, at least the advisory work on MA, on business advisory, is a benefit to India as well as to our legal profession, which is, I consider, the best in the world. So mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, life sciences is a huge area of potential for us. Tech is a huge area. We've spoken, part of we talk, spoke about data, and we've got all the, I mean, I can go into detail about data and data localization and disrupt um, the requirements of disrupting data flows. 
um, and, and you know, we can talk about that in more detail if you want to. Um, we could have data localization provisions like those agreed in the UK, Japan, CEPA. That would be ideal if we could achieve that. Um, defense. This is an area that India is very keen that we should get involved in. We've got the technology. We've got the know-how. India would be like us to manufacture defense in India. And they're also saying they do not insist on technology transfer. And I think that's fantastic if they're not in insisting on that. And if we can, the trust, the point that Tony made about trust is very important. Where let's be, I mean, do we have that level of trust, for example, when we're dealing with other countries? Well, I don't want to name them, but we know the obvious ones where there isn't a level of trust. Whereas with India, we have that level of trust uh, that exists. Um, the, the products, there's no running away from tariffs. I mean, Scotch whiskey, 150%. Just imagine if we can reduce that uh, down. What about cars? Uh, reducing those 150 over 100 percent, those have got to come down. Uh, and it, with the Australia deal, there was a ta tariff reduction on wine, um, and then agriculture. I mean, that's a sensitive area. But look at the collaboration we're doing. I chair a Cambridge University initiative called Tigris, which is the second green revolution in India. And if you look at the multidisciplinary collaboration we have between academics here with institutions like ICRISAT, the International Crop Research for Arid Zones in India, wow, I mean, it's increasing crop, crop yield multifold. Why don't we have that instead of having agriculture as a sensitive area, which is a problem area, it becomes a really positive area. Climate change, we've just finished the CBI, our net zero conference for two days. Look at the potential to collaborate with India on, on climate change, solar power, where India is a real leader, we're a leader in wind power, we're a leader in hydrogen, if we collaborate there, including uni using universities. The University of Birmingham has just had the world's first retrofitted hydrogen powered train. Just imagine what we could do uh, with India over there. So I think the more the collaboration that we can do, space is another area. Space, India launches satellites in a huge amount. We're really prioritizing space over here. I'm an honorary group captain in the Royal Air Force. We started a space command. You're very, you're very excited about the opportunities. I can see that in your answers, and I can, I, and I, I think that's very, very exciting. I mean, on climate, obviously, India is facing. Uh, you know, it was on the radio yesterday. The, the the heat already in the cities is extreme, and that is something I think that that's, has to be a key priority. Um, I'm going to refer back to the chair, but I would really welcome for anyone who hasn't spoken. Um, if you've got any insights, I, I know the CII very closely. I think they're a fantastic organisation, but on the fashion industry in particular, that would be my personal geeky interest after the meeting. Thank you. Back to the chair. Thanks, Tamara. Uh, can I go to Paul Paul Blomfield now? Yeah, thanks very much, Sherry. Um, I mean, obviously, post-Brexit trade deals are hugely important politically um, for the UK, but there's there's kind of mixed evidence on the economic benefits. And we just heard from Kim Darrick in our previous session, who reminded us uh, that the Japan deal is only worth 0.07% uh, 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 in terms of economic growth. Now, in terms of the India deal, obviously there's a there's a range of kind of landing zones and so it's a difficult question to answer but what um evaluation has there been uh, in terms of the potential impact on uh, growth of the uk um and are those estimates reasonable so let me start um with karen because you know you're looking for the most comprehensive deal absolutely right what might that look like in terms of benefits Yes, so the, the, I mean, I, I could give you various statistics of estimates that have been made. I mean, there's no question that once you have a good comprehensive deal, um, it, it benefits the ecosystem of service and goods and it bolsters a bilateral economic growth. Now, when you start quantifying it in the way that has been done um, with the Indian one, uh, there are various a range of figures of how it could benefit. The bottom line is, it's only going to work if organizations like the CII and the CBI, once the deal is done, actually promote the use of these trade deals. And that's the same thing with the Australian deal, same thing with the New Zealand one. It's all very well having these deals, but a business, especially SMEs, don't know about them, don't know how to take advantage of them. This is where the job, and also for high commissions in both countries. And we've got a fantastic trade commissioner uh, in India, Alan Gemmel, based in Mumbai. Uh, we've got a great network. And similarly over here, we've got to use networks like the CBR, which is throughout the UK, to actually promote the trade deals once they're done. That's the only way we can make the most of them. Okay, many, many thanks, Karen. So that's a hugely uh, important point. As a former member of the business committee, 
Um, it's uh, something we I was deeply conscious of. Um, but uh, perhaps if I could get a different view, Sangeeta, um, how, how do you see the uh, potential estimates on UK growth? Thank you so much, Paul. Um, as uh, Karun has just pointed, um, there are a, there are a range of estimates that are out there floating with regards to how much would be the benefit for both the partners. Clearly, there, there are going to be benefits in the long run. But I would like to emphasize again here that the benefits would the, the uh, amount of benefits that each partner will reap or harvest would depend on how deep and how comprehensive the deal is. Because if the deal is shallow, benefits will not really flow. It has to be really deep and there has to be focus on regulatory harmonization over time. And that is what is going to get the benefits of the deal for both the partners. And as already pointed out, I think business associations here have a very major role to play because the SMEs are the wheels of the economy to get them to get them to understand how the deal is going to um, work and how they can be part of the supply chain is what is really important. Thank you. Uh, Paul, just sorry, one, I mean, I could give you statistics galore. Yeah, I mean, one, one example is if, if removing duties alone would increase exports to India by 6.8 billion pounds, supporting tens of thousands of extra jobs. That's just tariffs. Um, you know, if you talk about wind power of the renewables uh we've got tariffs of 15 percent on wind turbine parts from the uk that's reduced so i, I mean I, you know we could go on with statistics yeah. but generally mm -hmm. the more comprehensive the more it's going to benefit okay well th thanks karen i mean i, I think secretary i've got uh, a, a kind of range of uh, statistics but anything that you your office could share with us um, would be uh, would be useful when pulling the report together, and that uh, applies uh, Sangeeta as well, and, to, and indeed to others. Um, Tony, you talked about um, uh, the the uh, gap between ambition and reality in terms of any potential landing zones. How do you see it? Um, how do I see it? I think that from from my point of view, that the, there's the, the tariffs, and the, and then there's the non-tariff barriers. If we if we just deal with some of the tariff barriers. Um, and the suppliers to some of the industry. Um, uh, Lord Frost would know very well about the Scotch Whiskey Association and you know, he, of course, negotiated the Brexit um, uh, uh, arrangements. So whiskey, cars, chemicals, um, all, and all, all, all the product related ones, I think other people are better um, um, educated to, to speak in, um, and, uh, about those. As to, as to the services sector, and, um, and I, I've referred to the legal services and intellectual services, uh, I've referred to um, education, which, of course, uh, K Karen and yourself are, um, are, are well versed in yourselves. My, my thoughts are that the um, that the intangible benefits of the of breaking down some of the service sector um, um, non tariff barriers, the movement of people, and the um, the education um, of lawyers in both ways um, going into India and coming back from. Um, and the professional services, um, the removal of those sort of protective barriers, um, which I think inhibit the collaboration that we've discussed, uh, would, would be an important part of this in, uh, growing relationship. Um, uh, and I agree that the SMEs of which the London Chamber of Commerce, for example, are, are one and the business improvement districts are, are another, are, are a, a good conduit to, it, to disperse that information and to prom prompt and promote uh, any deals that are, that are done. Um, uh, education in its broadest sense happens through those networks and collaborations um, and, and further up the scale, the collaboration between governments. So I, 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 you know, I'm a strong advocate of partnership and collaborative working. And, and I believe that in, particularly with the service sector um, and, uh, and in the legal, professional, technical um, and the hospitality sides that I know and can speak of with a degree of, um, of knowledge, um, we, we could all do, and we would both benefit, both India and the UK, um, from reducing the, inhi the inhi inhibitors, the, the barriers to doing trade with each other. And that can start off with the movement of people um, and the use of intellectual um, capacity both ways. Okay, many thanks. Uh, Pallavi, how do, you, uh, how do you see it in terms of the uh, uh, growth benefits? So um, as I was saying earlier, and it's been said several times also in the last few minutes, 
yes, market access through tariff reduction, but really the meat of the benefits is going to come from behind the border measures, from harmonization, from mutual recognition, from certification and testing accreditation, from simplification of procedures, services liberalization. That is, those are harder to measure, harder to analyze and assess in advance, but that, that really is where the actual benefits will come from, because even with tariff reduction, effective market access will only come if the other areas are addressed as well. And of course, services liberalization. I know a lot has been said about mode four, and I agree that, I mean, it is about time that we stop looking at mode four as something that is a no-go, because we're, we're past that. Mode one has made sure that mode four is less relevant every day for service provision across borders, but also mode one and digital trade. I think those are the key areas where any deal would benefit any two economies right now. The majority of trade is more digital by nature. COVID has increased the pace at which digital technologies are being adopted. And if we don't agree on those regulations and build capacity, technical cooperation, to be actually able to implement the regulations that we agree on, then you can negotiate any deal. But if you leave digital and mode one out of it, uh, it's always going to be a sore point. It's always going to make it, as Sangeeta was saying, not deep enough, not comprehensive enough, not collaborative enough. So I think for me, those are the key areas that the deal should really focus on. Yeah, well, thank, thank you all very much indeed. I, I guess that uh, there's some really useful stuff uh, within there, uh, but I guess we should focus on um, Karen's ambition for comprehensive. Going back to Sangeeta's very first point at the beginning of our session in terms of no red lines, um then uh, we've reason to be optimistic but also some really helpful points in terms of delivery so thank you go back to the chair now thanks paul um, i'm heading i'm handing over to stephen now okay uh, th thanks chair and uh, good morning to our witnesses um a very um short question but probably one that's fairly complicated and uh, with major re repercussions um, how complicated is the situation going to be in terms of concluding a deal um given um the India's reluctance to call out um, Russian aggression against Ukraine, and to what extent is the, the UK's ability to challenge India in that regard currently weakened, uh, given uh, a range of other factors? I'm not sure if anyone wants to, to volunteer to take that one first. Uh, Karen, I know you the best. Well, I'll let you, you, you're the one. You're the, you're the politician. You can, you can be diplomatic. Right. Well, um, you know, this is this is something where I've heard uh, very, very clearly from from you know, uh, as high a level as possible at the Indian end uh, what the reasoning for India's stance is. And if I give you an example, um, I was uh, with 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 Liz Truss, our foreign secretary in India. And there was an event where she and uh, Minister Jayashankar, the Indian Foreign Minister, um, and there was a, a Q and A with, with an audience. And one of the audience members, who was an, an English expat in Delhi, this was in Delhi, um, asked Minister Jayashankar, "Why are you buying oil, uh, um, uh, you know, um, from from Russia?" And uh, his answer was very stark. And Listra said, "I'm not. I'm not telling India what to do." It's up to India what it does with foreign relations. This is not for me to tell India what to do. So she was very diplomatic about it. And he, his answer, he said, can I just remind you, and this was now in March, it was the end of March. He said, can I remind you that as we speak, since the war in Ukraine has started, Europe has bought more oil and gas from Russia than it did before the war started. And you're telling me I can't buy uh, oil that my country needs for my people. So how, how, do, you, how do you answer that? Um, so, so India's India's situation is very delicate, and we respect their position, um, and it's to do with their geopolitical analysis of where they stand in the world, with their with with, with their neighbouring countries, with their relationship with Russia going back many years, um, and it's not for us to as long as it doesn't interfere with our deal. And they made it very clear that's one thing: a deal with the UK is completely separate. Um, and, uh, and we should never ever tell India what to do. Uh, India is India is is the yeah. fifth or sixth largest economy in the world with 1.4 billion people. What is not, yeah. by the way, is that India is still not a permanent member of the Security Council of the UN, and the UN reform is desperately needed. And we at the UK are fully behind that. 
Yeah. Well, well, Karen, given, given you are, you, you are uh, politically savvy, maybe you, you, by advice, maybe just push you back a little bit on, on that answer and appreciate that the, the issue about energy matters um, uh, may come across as being slightly hypocritical. But, but nonetheless, I mean, th this does seem to be a, a major geopolitical issue for, for, for all of us around, around the world. And there are fundamental values here around uh, non-aggression against states at, at heart and potential genocide um, uh, going on in Ukraine, or, or sorry, uh, better phrase that, war crimes um, happening in, in, in Ukraine uh, from, from Russia. And in that context, um, surely the UK should be using its position, not least as a Security Council member, um, to to be showing leadership and challenging other states to um, to stand up for the integrity of the international order as we we currently understand it to be, and rather than simply simply saying this is just an economic matter and we'll let India do do its own thing. And India has been very outspoken on wanting the violence to stop and condemning the violence and wanting peace. They've been very outspoken about that. So they they're saying that, that that's that's not been an issue. Uh, what is an issue is the structure of the UN that allows Russia and China to have a veto that has, does, that has proved that the UN has not been able to be effective at all during this whole conflict. And the, and the nub of it right now is the UN food program, the head of the UN food program. I don't know how many of you have seen David Beasley's report on the 11th of May, where he's predicted that there will be famine of over 300 million people if we do not unblock this, the port of Odessa. And the, Vadim Prastaika, the Ukraine ambassador, told me about this a few weeks ago. He said, nobody's woken up to it. Now the whole world has woken up to this. That's the sort of thing that we need to be addressing as a global community together. Sure. I just wondered, does, would anyone else want to come in on that, on that issue? Can I take a step? Well, yes, please. I don't know if I can really be unbiased in this situation, but I'm going to try anyway. So yes, the situation uh, with India's stance is political uh, on the Ukraine-Russia issue, but and I want to say, let's put the politics aside and talk economics for a second. But the truth is, even the politics of it was dealt with with economics. You no, know? in the beginning, the first reactions of most countries were export bans. Let's get Russia out of the WTO, trade sanctions, trade sanctions. And, and it's become quite clear that at the heart of all of it, economics is, is the problem and the solution. So in pure terms of economics and numbers, there isn't a better time to strengthen economic and strategic cooperation between countries like India and the UK, given everything that is happening with Ukraine, with Russia, with China's approach to pretty much anything over the last few years. Um, I don't think there has been a better time for India and UK to say, let's cooperate better on trade and economics, but also on strategic issues like defense and security, which have also come up in the context of this agreement. And I know that a lot has been said about the Indian stance on Ukraine and Russia, but if there is one thing that should be said, it is that India has been consistent, transparent, and straightforward in its response. It has never beaten about the bush, not mince words, not hidden behind ambiguity. And I think when you're looking at a trade deal, uh, it, it's safe to say that an administration that in a difficult situation like that can be transparent and straightforward in addressing all the questions that are coming to it in spite of all the pressure can be seen as also an equally transparent and straightforward partner for an economic deal. And I think those are, again, it all boils down to the economics of it. And, and I would say that it would be counterintuitive to relate India's position on Ukraine with a trade deal right now. Uh, if I may, Stephen, just to build on what Pallavi just sure. said, the yeah. stronger the, our, our security um, uh, relationships are with India, along with trade, the stronger the relationship is overall. And with Australia, we have that. We have the five eyes, yeah. we have the US, yeah. and we have the free trade deal. With India, I've suggested that the UK should join Quad. India is a member of Quad, the, and yeah. then it's a full circle if we have that. So we, we should be doing things like that, going the extra mile in our security relationship uh, together, which will even strengthen the trade relationships and the trust yeah. is even stronger then. And if I just simply very broadly, that trust is critical to this uh, and, and people need to be able to trust, countries need to be able to trust each other and that if we make agreements, we will stick by them. Mm. If we say we're going to give 0.7% of our GDP um, to assist other people in, to enable the broader arrangements and, and uh, relationships to foster, to create markets and to be able to support that activity, then we should stick with those kind of things. Where every, every time, as John Major said, you know, we, we damage our soft power if we, if we you know, get, we skirt around agreements. And so my, my, my view is that um, 
the relations with India and the United Kingdom will be strong. They'll be stronger still if we can trust each other more and more and we can build on step by step the, uh, the relationships. Sometimes they can be triggered, as, as, as um, Lord Bill Murray has said, you know, we, took the, we, we are now focusing on what could happen with the food across, uh, uh, across the world. It, it could be that there's a positive trigger from um, something that might be um, en energy or environment related, that there's some, some, a, a positive trigger as a result of you know, fertilizer or solar power or some other collaboration between the UK and India that then stimulates a positive movement towards a stronger relationship. We don't know where that will be, but I think if we start with the foundation stone of all relationships, and which is trust, um, and then we can and provide the information and the understanding to enable us to build a stronger relationship. And I, I, I don't really want to get into necessarily um, the specifics of the Ukraine, um, Russia, yeah. And yeah. UK politics, but, but that, though, though, that soft power that's discussed that maybe have been fractured or diminished in, in relation to, um, to Brexit and needs to be re-established and strengthened and supported yeah. in the future. Yeah, I mean, cer certainly I respect all, all your answers and I certainly take the point made around um, trust. But I, I just wonder at times um, if we don't use our influence with, with India that um, basically we're allowing Russia to trade diversion um, else, elsewhere and the, the ability of, of sanctions against Ukraine or against Russia to to try to achieve a, a, an outcome in, in Ukraine, I think may, may well be diminished. But no doubt uh, as a wider debate for another time. Back to you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, Paul Gervin is not able to join us today, so I'll just do the last question. And I think I know what everybody thinks about this already, which is how important do you feel this trade relationship is for both countries? Um, so rather than asking that, can I just go to each of you one at a time and, and just ask if there are any final comments you have or thoughts for this commission that would be helpful for us to hear. So, Pallavi, can I start with you? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, final thoughts. I think I'm gonna go back to saying services, digital, extremely important. Stakeholder engagement, extremely important. I know Karan has said a lot about that as well, and I agree. Um, I know that Tony was saying earlier as well about trust. And I think a lot of it is a combination of how deeply and how collaboratively stakeholders engage in the process. Because going back to what Sangeeta was saying, the agreement will only be deep and comprehensive enough if the stakeholders were participating at a level. And, and I think that's what's missing in most trade negotiations. You never know where to draw the line on where to bring the stakeholders in. And I feel like the, the industry task force is a great way to do that, to bring the, make them actual, actually accountable or you know, responsible for the process. So that's extremely important. I think behind the border measures will be extremely important. And, uh, and to look at it as more than just a trade deal, more than just market access at all times, I think will be critical. Lovely, thank you. Stan Keita. Thank you so much. I completely endorse what Pallavi has said. And yes, the it's really very important to address the non-tariff measures and behind the border measures because they are literally uh, the elephant in the room. I think this, if you ask me in addition to what I have said, this is actually a great opportunity uh, for uh, the UK to lead its efforts to tackle climate change uh, under the proposed trade agenda. Um, so that is something I would like to add in addition to what Pallavi has already mentioned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, well, I uh, echo what has been said before. I don't want to repeat what I've said, but the um, but what what I what I would say is that in relative importance, given um, a relatively stable relationship with um, uh, the, the US and with other parts of the world, a, a, re, a, a rebalancing of our relationship with Europe, that the relationship with India and Asia more generally is really important. So you, the question was about how important and, and, and I would place uh, increasing priority on this, not just as a market, but because of we've touched on um, and Stephen's question about uh, other geopolitical strategic defense, um, um, food, uh, we're, we're all on um, uh, in, in a relationship where any impact has on, from one country has an impact on another. We've learned that, if, not, if we've learned nothing else from COVID, that a, an, an incident that could happen in China has now affected every human being on the planet, and we've all got to respond to it. We, uh, Lord, Lord Bill Murray talked about um, the food crisis, which is you know, possibly going to worsen, and, and the, the millions, the hundreds of millions that will be affected by it. So my, my, my conclusion to that would be, it, there's, no, there's never been a more important time, and there probably is never a, a more important continent 
that we need to engage with in a constructive way than to deal with Asia and India right now. And post-Brexit, there's never been a more important time to be engaging and to demonstrate that we can um, collaborate and form sensible partnerships, not just trade, not just economic, not just um, in, environmental and sustainable, with another country, a large country, which has huge potential for growth in, in bilateral relations. And I, I think that's probably where I'd end it. Thank you. And finally, Karen. Thank you very much. And this has been a, a, a very good, good session. I just want to just make a few points that we may not have covered and I'll, I'll fire them quick fire. So one is the integrated review last year that we had the first time ever as a country with defense and security and development and diplomacy and all, you know, all foreign policy together tilt to the Indo-Pacific. It's no longer the Asia Pacific, it's the Indo-Pacific. So, you know, it is a priority country for us strategically in every way. Movement of people, we, we've touched on this, but at the moment, for example, foreign workers can go to India, including from the UK, and stay for 90 days. But for ASEAN countries, they can stay for 180 days. So we, we must make sure that, you know, in the Australia deal, it goes to the other extreme. Young people, youth mobility, 18 to 35 year olds, can stay three years in either country with the Australia FTA. Now, I know that's not going to be happening in the India one, but at least we can go from 90 to 180 days. Um, and that's one. The next is with uh, mutual recognition of qualifications. This was brought up earlier on, I think Pallavi mentioned it. One-year degrees, our one-year degrees are still not officially recognized in India. I mean, the private sector recognizes, the public sector don't. Let's make that now officially recognized. Opening up of foreign universities in India, that is now going to be made formalized. UK universities, we've just, Birmingham opened up a campus in Dubai, but, but universities like ours would be very interested in opening up um, in, in India. Uh, so I think that should be addressed in this as well. Um, Pallavi mentioned this, the importance of the regulatory cooperation between the UK and India. Uh, this is a great opportunity to address that um, head on and, and deal with that. Uh, we haven't really talked about this much, but IP, uh, India is a huge uh, exporting destination for UK's innovative products, but the IP regime in India is much weaker than ours over here, and that could threaten our innovation. That needs to be addressed head on in the FTA. Procurement, I think Sangeeta mentioned it earlier. Uh, the government of India's procurement accounts for nearly 30% of India's GDP. Uh, there's a huge opportunity for UK firms to win contracts there. This is a great opportunity to trade with this agreement uh, to deal with, with that. Um, and, and finally, with um, immigration as well, movement of people, foreign universities, at the moment, um, at our end, India is not on the preferred list of, for international students. There's a list of four, like you can correct me, it's 24 countries. China's on that list. Indian students are not on that preferred list. That can be addressed uh, in this trade agreement as well. And finally, at Tony's point, which is a very important point um, about soft power, I believe that the UK is a country which has one of the strongest combinations of hard and soft power in the world. India also has a huge amount of hard and soft power, and that combination is very, very powerful combined. Thank you. That was extremely um, comprehensive, Karen. Thank you for that. And th thank you, everyone. Um, that was actually a very good session that, that focused more on opportunities than some of the other sessions we've done have, have had. So I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the time and wanted to thank um, Pallavi, Sangeeta, Tony and Karen for being so open and having such a good discussion today. And again, sorry for my croaky voice. And thank you to um, all of our um, commissioners and i hope you all have a, a very good day thank you thank you very thank much. you yes. and feel better soon <laughs> thank, thank you, you. Cool. thank you bye thank bye. you everyone bye, -bye.